Hey everybody, this is Ronald Long with Wayside Chapel's 410 Middle School Ministry. And if you're like me, probably at your place, you are playing a whole lot of board games. <laughs> our, our family's got this big blue cabinet where we keep all of our board games in. And we've been kind of diving in there at the end of the day when we've kind of exhausted all the outside play activities and we're really done looking at the screens. Don't want to be looking at those anymore. And so we get in there and we... We play some board games. It's just one way to kind of keep our sanity towards the end of the day. This one is one. Ooh, this one is one that we've been playing a little bit. It's called Trouble, and you might remember it from your childhood past. It's that one where it's got that little bubble that goes doop doop, and the dice pops up. And if you get a six, you can one of your people can come out, and you get a one. Everybody else's can come out. And you try to go all the way around the board and get back to home. It just sounds like it would be a lot of fun. And normally, our family does okay with playing it, but I think the game is called Trouble because it causes trouble sometimes in your family. And we, we can get a little heated playing this game. And, you know, it's weird because sometimes you, you want to get upset and you want to get mad. And maybe there's a little bit of strategy that goes into this. You move uh, peg A instead of peg B. But in reality, when you hit that little dice thing and just go, doot, doot, uh, that, that's the number you got. Your peg either is going to move three spaces here or, or three spaces there. You're not really in control when you're playing this board game. And that's normally how a lot of these board games go. You roll dice, you spin a spinner, you draw a card, and, and that's what you've got to do. You're not in control the whole time. Sometimes that's fun for people. Other people are just cannot handle the fact that they aren't in control. And... As we're kind of going around this season right now, we're understanding that a lot of people would love to be in control. Like, we would like to be in control of our situation. We want to be able to say that we can go to the store, uh, that we could go to the movies. I'd like to go to the gym. Uh, there's a lot of things that we'd like to do, but we're not in control right now. There's other things that are in control, and it can be really frustrating while we think about it and think about all the things that we can't control and yeah, I don't know about you, but if I stew about that stuff for a while, I don't end up in a very good place. This week, we're going to continue our encounters with Jesus and we're going to talk about when Jesus goes to trial. Now, as we're reading through this, this ends up being like a really sad picture if you think about it, Jesus is betrayed. Uh, Jesus is abandoned by his disciples. They don't go after him. Uh, even Peter, who says that he would never deny Jesus, ends up denying him three times. As you're reading this, and if you, you don't have the proper mindset, you would go, this is just a terrible, terrible scenario. And it's not great, but there's something that I want to make sure that we don't miss as we read through this. So let's start, and we're going to start in John 18, 1 and 2. It says, After Jesus had said these things, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now this is after they had just had the Last Supper. Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with the disciples. So Judas took a company of soldiers and some temple police from the chief priests and the Pharisees came there with the lanterns and torches and weapons. And then Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen, went out to them and said, Who is it you're looking for? Jesus of Nazarene, they answered. I'm he, Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. And when he told them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Who are you looking for? Jesus the Nazarene, they said. I told you, I'm he, Jesus replied. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the words he had said. I've not lost one you have given me. Uh, have you ever been caught doing something you weren't supposed to do? I got to tell you, as, as a youth pastor who's taken uh, lots of kids on trips and things like that, I typically know when things are going on. Mostly because you guys are really bad at being caught. <laughs> That, that's not a bad thing. I actually want you to be good at, uh, I want you, don't want you to get too good at being caught because that means you've got a lot of experience. Normally when you get caught, normally when I get caught, uh, 
I get really sweaty. I start like looking side to side like, oh no, did, is this thing happening? Uh, and maybe I start talking really fast, trying to come up with an explanation of why I'm doing the thing that I'm not supposed to be doing. When we get caught, we start acting guilty. Now what's crazy here is that Jesus is being betrayed. And we know this, and the disciples probably knew this, but Jesus had done nothing wrong. He wasn't acting guilty. So when everybody says, uh, who is it you're looking for? Jesus, he goes, yeah, that's me. This would have been a perfect opportunity to like lie, <laughs> but this is Jesus. He doesn't lie. And you know, he's, he knows he's not guilty either. So he has no problem being caught because he knows what's happening and he knows what's going down. And they end up, they take him to Ananias, the chief priest, and there they say that he's blaspheming because he's claiming to be the son of God. And then it goes from the chief priest to a man named Pilate, who is the governor of the area. And he questions Jesus a couple different times. And we'll look in at John 18, 33 through 35. Then Pilate went back into the headquarters, summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you asking this on your own or have others told you about me? I'm not a Jew. Am I? Pilate replied. Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. As it is, my kingdom does not have its origin here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. You say that I'm a king, Jesus replied. I was born for this, and I've come into this world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? said Pilate. After he said this, he went out to the Jews and again told them, I find no grounds for charging him. Uh, I live next to a really interesting guy. His name is Cleo. Uh, he is a lawyer and a pastor. So we end up having really neat conversations. And one time he was telling me about a trial that he had and the guy that he was trying, uh, the guy he was defending, he had what he felt like really good evidence. And there was a jury that was uh, looking at the evidence and looking at what's going on. But according to Cleo, this guy was not a uh, choir boy, we'll say. He did not have a perfect record. But in this particular case, Cleo felt like he had a pretty good, solid case of evidence. And yet the guy was still found guilty. Now, later on, he got a chance to talk to one of the jurors, not something he got usually would get a chance to do. And he just said, hey, I just want to ask, uh, why did you guys end up saying he was guilty of this crime? And the response was, well, we actually, we were pretty sure he didn't do this particular crime. But since he's such a bad guy, we didn't want him out on the street either. So we went ahead and said he was guilty. Now, wouldn't you just hate to be in that circumstance where you get tried for something and you think, okay, the evidence is good. I'm not guilty of this. I'm going to be fined. But because people think you're a guilty person, they will go ahead and convict you anyways just to get you off the street. Uh, none of us have perfect records. Some of us might have a less, more or less perfect <laughs> record than others, but none of us are perfect. What Pilate is saying to the Jews who are angrily trying to get Jesus convicted of claiming to be the king, of starting a rebellion, Pilate's saying, I don't find any reason to convict this guy. Jesus is perfect. He had no, absolutely no reason being at a trial, and yet he was there, continuing to answer truthfully the questions that were being asked of him. So let's see. In John 19, 14 through 16, it says, It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about the sixth morning. And he told the Jews, Here is your king, Pilate did. But they shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Should I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. So then, because of them, he handed him over to be crucified. Therefore, they took Jesus away.
Uh, like I was telling you guys earlier with board games, <laughs> there's a difference between me giving up and letting my kids win. Now, I wish I won against my kids more often, but in reality, I'm just not that great at games. They actually win when I'm trying to win. <laughs> now, you might know what this is like. You're playing games with somebody and you know that you could easily beat them, but if you did beat them, that uh, they'd be upset, they'd cry, they'd be mad. And so maybe you think, you know what, it's not worth it. I'm just going to let them win. Jesus, like he was talking to Pilate, said, if my kingdom was of this world, my people would fight for me. You'd have no chance whatsoever. But Jesus said, because I know things that you don't know, I'm not giving up. Instead, I'm going to let you win. So that Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. And Jesus ultimately was crucified. I mean, he was put on a cross. He was nailed there with his hands and his feet attached to pieces of wood. He was beaten. He was tortured. All of these terrible things were happening. And remember, Jesus did nothing wrong. But he also allowed it to happen. Look at this. John 19, 28 through 30. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they fixed a sponge full of sour water on hyssop and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It's finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Jesus knew that everything had been accomplished. Then he said, I'm thirsty to take care of one last thing. And then it says that Jesus gave up his spirit. They didn't kill him. Jesus allowed himself to die. God is always in control. And in fact, this encounter with Jesus, that's what I want us to get. Jesus has power over control. Jesus was in control of this entire horrible situation. There wasn't one moment while this was going on that Jesus was not in control. He knew what was happening. He allowed himself to be caught. He allowed himself to go to trial. He allowed himself to be crucified. And then when it was over, he allowed himself to die. Jesus was always in control. Now here's the thing. We want control, but we don't want responsibility. Often that's the case. We want to be able to call the shots, but if things go wrong, we don't want to take responsibility for them if things go south. What we don't want is to be responsible for things and not be in control. But this is the reality. We're responsible for our decisions. We're responsible for our choices, for our thoughts, for our words. We're responsible for the things that are going on. But Jesus is always in charge. Just like over the cross, Jesus is in control of what's going on. Even in this crazy pandemic time, Jesus knows what's happening. None of this caught him by surprise. He's in control. And therefore, we are responsible for our actions. We're responsible for maintaining an attitude that says that we understand that God knows what he's doing, even though it looks like to us things are absolutely crazy. It means we need to watch our tone. It means we need to be careful with our actions. It means we need to show our parents love, even when they're trying to homeschool us. And maybe you don't think it's going as absolutely well as it could be going. We're responsible for ourselves. But Jesus is always and will always be in control because Jesus has power over control. Hey, thanks so much for being a part of this. I'm really excited for something that we're going to get a chance to do here this week. In fact, if you are watching this right now, I hope that you might grab a parent and get a chance to do some really, really neat um really, really neat things that we're going to be doing called Masterpiece Theater. What I want you guys to be doing is looking at these pictures right here. Check this out. I want you guys to be thinking about how you can possibly recreate this famous scene. I'll no, point that way. This famous scene, this famous picture, and then send that to us. And actually, 
I, down below in the comments, I'm going to put lots of these pictures that you can see. I want you guys to get them, recreate them at your house with your family, your pets, your whatever you've got lying around the house, and send them to us. We want to put them online and show you guys off on Wednesday when we do Echo Online. It's going to be super fun. So make sure you go down to the links and get a part of and get those pictures that we want you to copy and then send to us. You can send it to me via email. You can uh, direct message us over Facebook or Instagram, wherever you want to. But Hey, let's have some fun with this. Give you guys something to do while we are still quarantined and still in this crazy time. Hey, I'm Ronald. I'm the middle school pastor at the 410 campus for Wayside Chapel. I miss you guys. miss you girls. But hopefully we get to hang out together soon. Y'all have a great week, and we'll see you on Wednesday. Bye.